Hi everyone, my name is Grace and I'm the event coordinator at University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington. The oldest independent bookstore in the region, we're celebrating our 120th anniversary this year. You can find out more about our events on all our social media channels. I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy during this time. Now more than ever, books bring us together and University Bookstore is delighted and honored to celebrate Andrew Altschul's latest novel, The Gringa, with this virtual event. Andrew is the author of three novels, including his latest, The Gringa, a fictional account of the real life of American activist Leonora Gelb, who spent 15 years in a Peruvian prison for aiding leftist rebels. You can purchase the book anytime during this event and after by clicking on the book link below. Andrew's work has appeared in Esquire, McSweeney's, and Plowshares, to name a few. A former Wallace Stegner Fellow and Jones Lecturer at Stanford University, he was also the founding books editor at The Rumpus. Andrew currently teaches at Colorado State University. After his reading, he'll be joined in conversation by David Shields, prolific best-selling author of 22 books, and a professor right here at the University of Washington. David's books are also available for purchase on our website. A recipient of Guggenheim and NEA fellowships and a senior contributing editor of Conjunctions, David's work has also been published in numerous magazines. Before we start, I'd like to take a few moments to read David's review of The Gringa because it really could not be said any better. What every even slightly conscious American writer is trying to figure out right now is how to write about the state of America without clambering up atop a soapbox. This is a considerable achievement of Andrew Altschul's The Gringa. And on those powerful notes of David, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew for his reading. Thank you very much, Grace. Um, and thank you to the University Bookstore. Um, most of you probably know I spent a lot of time in Seattle. I think of it as 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 one of my cities, and uh, there were very few events I was looking forward to more on this book tour than the University Bookstore, where um, I've browsed and sat and read and bought books more times than I can count, but have never actually done a reading there. So um, that one kind of hurt, um, but I was really happy that we were able to schedule this virtual event and uh, hopefully one day when the coast is clear um, and we do things like sit in the same room with people again, um, we'll be able to do this uh, IRL as they say. Um, so thanks again to the bookstore and, and also thanks again to, to David Shields for, for joining me for this event. Um, you know, in addition to uh, being a writer and a thinker who I just respect enormously and, and someone who I think has contributed um, in really unique ways to contemporary literature. Um, I also count him as a, as a good friend. And so I'm really looking for, forward to this conversation in a little while. Um, I'm going to read from the Gringa. Um, and uh, so one of, the, one of the kind of frustrations of all this is unlike, unlike the other books I've read, the, the opening section of the Gringa um, is just exactly the perfect length for a bookstore reading. It comes in at like 19 minutes, which is just exactly right for a real life bookstore reading. Uh, a, a friend of mine once said, anything over 20 minutes is a hostage situation. Uh, but I think that threshold is a, a little bit lower for these online readings. So I'm gonna read um, sort of an abridged version where I jump around a little bit um, in the opening. Um, the opening section, which is really a prologue to the novel, but introduces itself to the reader as an author's note. So this is the gringa. Leonora Gelb hated America. She hated its heart and its soul, its sick mind and its flabby diseased body. She hated its dreams of itself, its fantasies about the rest of the world, paranoid, arrogant, weaponized fantasies. And she hated its waking realities, the sprawled, filth-strewn cities and prim, stingy towns, the metastatic freeways and supersized cars, the factory farms and clear-cut hills and amber waves of subsidized grain. 
She hated its festering landfills and its first class hotels, its frenzied shopping malls and all you can eat buffets, hated its fast food abattoirs and five star whites only restaurants, the elegance of its ivory towers and the proud ignorance of its gun toting flag waving patriots. Ignorance fostered in crumbling public schools and enforced by corporate media all too happy to dance to the hegemon's tune. She hated America's wage slaves and its business overlords, its gated subdivisions and wasted ghettos and its shared national pastimes, the gladiatorial sporting events and disgusting beauty pageants and goose-stepping parades, the idiot sitcoms and smug TV news anchors and its movies, God, its movies about intellectual dwarves with superior firepower who heroically, democratically slaughter everything in their path. Leonora, Leo to her family, Comrade Linda, to her friends in the revolution, hated American culture as much as its gunboat economic policies. And what really was the difference? The dirty Harrys and the Marlboro men who brandished their big dicks and dared you to read their lips, make their day. The pop sensations, barely pubescent girls taught by men to pantomime a grotesquerie of sex for money. The murderous video games and diabetic soft drinks and breakthrough pharmaceuticals to cure phony ailments the populace had to be taught to suffer all rammed down the throat of the developing world, safe delivery ensured by nuclear submarine, by armed battalion, underwritten by Chevron and the World Bank and relentlessly promoted by lie after slavering lie. Lies for which no one would ever be punished. Because in America, it's not a lie if it turns a profit, not a lie if it upholds the racial hierarchy, not a lie if it oozes from the mouth of someone we admire, soldier, sex pot, self-made tyrant. When I look at her photograph, that's the first thing I see, her outrage, her refusal to believe the lies. In the shape of her mouth stretched into a wet scream, the flared muscles of her neck, I see her fury at a government without integrity, a president who deceived the world with impunity. In her piss-soaked jeans, the broken arm stiff at her side, I see her disgust with a country that would spy on its own people, ignore its own laws, kill its own children. Certainly you've seen this photograph, taken at the infamous press conference in Lima, Peru on August 25th, 1998, three days after her arrest. You've noted in the way she leans toward the reporters like a Doberman on a leash, her contempt for a press that whistled while thousands were rounded up, held in secret prisons, subjected to all manner of abuse, a press that branded as disloyal any who insisted upon the truth. Who hasn't seen this image, nor wondered at the small figure surrounded by soldiers with impressive weaponry against the backdrop of a foreign flag? No one who's viewed the footage can forget her gale force anger, the threat conveyed by her every gesture. No one can ignore her clenched fist. But her eyes tell a different story. When I look into her eyes, small and gray behind thick glasses, open shockingly wide, I don't see the violent criminal so many have described. I see vulnerability, the pain of betrayal. I see innocence of a kind. How to explain this incongruity, to bridge the gap between that bedraggled figure and her iron fury, how to sort out the truth from the lies. It's been 10 years since that disastrous press conference. I've been asked to find the real Leonora Gelb, a task for which no one could be less qualified. The 1998 press conference was the first time most Peruvians had seen Leonora Gelb, eight hectic minutes in which her fate was all but sealed. Raw-eyed and hoarse, she marched into the room without an introduction, turning upon the reporters her battered, vengeful gaze. The real danger to Peruvians is not the Cuarta Filosofia, it's their own government, she cried. The worst violence in this country is state violence. Ask the campesinos whose land was stolen, whose children are dying. Ask the people whose brothers and husbands have disappeared. It was a Tuesday morning, the ragged end of a restive, clammy winter. The basement room stank of shoe polish and spilled coffee. Three days earlier, the house she was, li- the house she was renting in the, in the leafy Pueblo Libre neighborhood had been sacked by special forces, ravaged, its windows blown out, its white walls strafed. They dragged the bodies of six militants from that house, flaunted them to reporters while the president walked through the wreckage and shook soldiers' hands. A demon, he'd called her, flapping her passport at the TV cameras. A psychopath. For three days, she'd been locked away while the press stoked public fury. Now, she stood surrounded by nervous soldiers, their rifles at the ready, as if to sell her, to sell the idea of her. Someone who required such precautions must be dangerous indeed. 
But the demon was doll-sized, something farcical about her wild, wiry hair, her wet pants. In her powder blue sweatshirt and granny glasses, she looked more like a third grade teacher than a murderous subversive. They could not match this figure to the footage the whole country had seen, the burning house, the smashed gate, smoke whirling up into searchlights like a vision of apocalypse. They did not see a monster until she opened her mouth to speak. No one can deny the terrible inequality, she said. No one can deny the racism and exploitation that keep millions in poverty while a tiny group enriches itself. Her Spanish was perfect, but her accent gave her statement a, me a mechanical, robotic air. This country was founded on violence, built on violence. The wealthy protect their privilege with violence. Just shut up already, someone yelled out. There was low laughter, a ripple in the crowd. They could, they could see steam on her glasses, a stain creeping down her thighs. Why were there guns in the house, Leo? Another voice called, and then a deluge. Who stole the military uniforms? Leo, why did you have blueprints of Congress? Were you working with the Cubans? Leo, is this justice, she cried, is it democracy? Leo, were you the girlfriend of Augustine Duenas? Leo, do you work for the CIA? Where is Mateo Peña, Leo? Did you know Angelica Ramos was in the shining path? Did you know she was a killer? Are you a terrorist, Leo? At this, she pulled up, blinking. The room took a breath. Leonora, are you a terrorist? Her eyes scanned the back wall as though looking for a familiar face. The question came again and she licked her lips, a whole country waiting for her answer. Years later in the forsaken silence of her prison cell, she would still lie awake contemplating a word. She would turn it over in her mind, try to understand its nature, to find her reflection in its empty depths. Leonora, are you a terrorist? The present work is, among other things, an attempt to answer that question. It was begun in April 2008, 10 years after her arrest, trial, and conviction. It was begun under circumstances that are somewhat cloudy, even, or especially to me, but in the most concrete sense, it began as an article for My.World, the self-styled online omnivorous media behemoth launched five years prior by Jackson Durst. You'll recall the site's ambitious tagline, All the News. From the start, it was a poor fit for that outlet, owing to the complexity of the subject matter and the attention span of the target audience, to say nothing of the limitations of its author. Put simply, it should never have been assigned to me, but it was, and I've done what I could. What was it Donald Rumsfeld said about going to war with the army you have? Subsequent events further hindered my progress, which is to say I had neither the experience nor the skills necessary to the undertaking. Anyone might have predicted this, Many, in fact, did, but poor preparation and a general lack of knowledge rarely dissuade the powerful once they've set their course. Quite the opposite, actually, as our country's recent misadventures once again make plain. Once fate pointed its palsied finger, there was no turning back. The story, it would seem, was doomed from the start, destined for this sorry, unsatisfying form. I suppose it's also true that my background, my obsessions, and personal concerns played a role, whatever my best intentions. Detachment, objectivity, qualities natural to a responsible journalist seem not to be my strength. If they were, I might never have left the U.S. I might have stayed to enjoy the ongoing calamity of our own dirty war with its unsavory protagonists and hideous mistakes. But for all that, I set out, if reluctantly, to tell Leonora's story, not my own. I set out to understand her, to say something valuable and true. I knew there was more to her than a photo, more than shocking headlines. Of course I knew, but what I didn't know, what I could not have known, was what her story would come to mean to me, nor how badly I would need to see it through. Leo, are you a terrorist? Was she or was she not a terrorist? In these pages, I've tried to sort through the evidence to determine what she wanted, what she might have felt. From disparate fragments and glaring absences, I've tried to build a coherent narrative, one that does justice to the history and its many victims. I've tried to keep my own feelings out of it. I've tried to consider all sides. But it's been more than a decade. The words terror, freedom, democracy, war don't mean the same things anymore. Leo, the reporters shouted. Her hesitation had made them predatory. Answer the question. A man stood on a chair and yelled, fuck you, Leo, and fuck the philosophers. How many of them did you have sex with, Leo? Leo, why did you come to this country? Why do you want to kill Peruvians? How are they treating you in jail, Leo? Have you been raped? 
The soldiers moved to quiet them. Leo's breath came heavily, a shadow of alarm playing across her face. Everyone waited. Just as it seemed there would be no answer, the prisoner cleared her throat. The Quarta Filosofia is not a terrorist organization, she said. The sudden crush caught the soldiers off guard. Tape rolling, flashes exploding. Leo, they called out, Leo! Is it terrorism to love freedom, she said? Is it terrorism to hate injustice, to feed people who are hungry? She lifted her broken arm as far as she could, the hand white and clammy, clenched with effort. When I watch the clip, I see her trying to quiet the crowd, to finish what she wanted to say. But the press told a different story, repeated it until it became its own truth. La Leo raised her fist in defiance. She made a gesture of militant solidarity. She dug her own grave. There are no terrorists in the Quarta Filosofia, she said. It's a revolutionary movement fighting to improve the lives of people who've been forgotten. She craned her neck, her voice cracking. If it's terrorism to help poor mothers and sick children, then I am a terrorist. If it's a crime to stand for workers and the oppressed, then I accept whatever punishment I'm given. And there it was, the red meat, the money shot. Every newspaper in Peru ran the photo the next morning the hysterical savage, the white girl brandishing her fist, and the identical headline, Yo Soy Terrorista. It was a disaster, a kind of suicide. Her captors could not believe their ears. At the U.S. Embassy, lawyers smacked their desks. In a room at the Lima Sheraton, where they'd waited three days to see their daughter, her father hunched on the bed and sobbed. Her mother, standing, swore under her breath. Five days later, Leonora Gelb was sentenced to life in prison for treason and leadership of a terrorist group. The prosecutor stood before the judges in their canvas hoods and shrugged the matter out of his hands. Senores, he said, the prisoner has already confessed. Thanks for listening to that. That's the opening of the gringa. And um, now I'm going to invite my friend David Shields, I'm going to unmute him, okay. and uh, we're going to talk oh, about it. And, and 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 one of the things I want to say is just that David um, was is someone who read uh, this novel pretty early on, many many years ago, um, and uh, was one of a very small handful of people who were just unrelentingly encouraging to me um, as I worked on this book and as I worked to to um, to get it published, and so. Um, I thanked you before, David, in private, but I want to thank you again now for for being such a such a stalwart with this well, book, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks. Well, congratulations. I mean, it's such a consummation, Andrew, to see it, you know, in final form, to participate in some small way with you on in this project. I mean, I've you know I've seen various iterations of the book, and it's so great to see it in in beautiful completed form. I forget how much shorter, I mean, there was a longer version, wasn't there? I mean, it was, it started out, I mean, it's still a long substantial book, but it was even even longer in earlier versions. Yeah, well, anyone anyone who ever reads my work in progress knows there's always a longer version right. than, than what we arrive at. Um, I think, you know, right now it's about, it's like a little over 400 pages. And I think, um, I think the version that I first, maybe showed to my agent was was close to 500 maybe even a little longer than that so yeah i mean there was there was a lot of stuff that got cut for sure that that sure. needed to be cut sure but i mean i'm sure you've been asked a lot of the same question i forgot the pub date of the book was you know what early uh, march 10th march 10th so yeah. you know you've been asked every question i'm sure and you've asked yourself every question so in the relatively brief time we have i thought i'd try and ask, you know, everyone asks you probably stuff about, you know, the Romana Clef of the book and this and that, but I thought I'd try and come at it a slightly different direction as you can probably imagine I would. And I think the first thing for me that, I don't know if this interests you at all, but to me, you're kind of in a way like a man without a generation in the sense that you are so much a writer who, I mean, I think you're around 50, right? Are you around, I forget how old you are. Give or take. And that, you know, like so few writers of your generation, I'm about 13 years older than you or something like that. And I kind of feel like I'm not connected to my generation of writers that much. I feel oddly connected to women writers of, who are in their 40s, all those writers I really care about. 
and um, I mean, so many of the writers that that you love are who I know that you love or who, whose influence in the book is manifest are writers of the generation older than mine, you know, DeLillo, Doc, Dr. O, Stone, Pynchon in a way, Graham Greene in certain ways. And I just, I just wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. I mean, every writer's different. I don't think we're defined by generations, but it really, inter I mean, it's such a big, ambitious, capacious book. It's a big banging book. And it's sort of like, where does this come from? Where does Andrew come from? You're, you're, you're supposed, I'm trying to think of writers of your generation would be like, like Brett Ellis or somebody like that. If you were born oh, around the same, the I, same I age as him generation, um, you're a no, little bit younger than him. Also, like, I think where do you come from? I guess yeah. I'm trying to ask. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, first of all, I want to, uh, you know, this this isn't exactly what you were asking, but but um, just thinking in terms of generations, like I, um, first of all, I, I consider myself extremely lucky in that, um, you know, over the course of my career, first in graduate school um, at UC Irvine, and then and then later when I had a fellowship at Stanford, I I have been so privileged to work and study with. Um, and 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 form really close friendships with just some absolutely magnificent writers, and and I'm I'm actually looking at two of them on the top of my screen right now, Andrew Weiner and Charmaine Craig, who came to this event and who were students with me at UC Irvine, you know, a few years ago. Um, and but but every everywhere I've gone, I have been really really lucky to have smart and talented and really dedicated writers as friends and as readers, many of whom, you know, 20 years later are still um, my first readers on things. Um, and that's especially important because I do think it's true, you know, to get closer to your question, I, I think it's true that the publish that the US publishing industry has gotten more conservative. It has gotten more um, inwardly focused. Um, and the, you know, the work that is really privileged and celebrated and publicized and given huge advances nowadays, generally speaking, is, um, is, is work that uh, does not interest itself um, in any complex ways with, uh, with politics, with any kind of um, inherent cultural or social critique. Uh, and that's greatly to our loss. And, and, and that's not a, across the board true, of course. And I think that a lot of the most interesting work coming out from writers of my generation and writers younger than me uh, is the work being done by writers of color. Um, who tend to be much more drawn to material like this for, for some very, very good reasons. Um, but white American writers now, you know, many of them are not interested in, in work like that. And the ones who are, are, are very clearly discouraged from work like this by editors, by teachers, by agents, um, uh, by, by publishers, sales forces who believe, you know, maybe partly correctly, that American readers aren't interested in politics. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was probably different, you know, once upon a time. And so some of my role models just in general, but certainly for this book, you name them. I mean, El Doctoro, um, Don DeLillo. Uh, I, I, lo I love thinking about Graham Greene because he's a writer I came to very late. Um, and, uh, you know, he's a, a couple generations back, obviously. Right. Um, but man, could, could the guy spin a tale. Um, right. But there are also, there are also writers um, who are, are closer to my age. Um, who wrote books that were that were really um, influential on me when I was trying to figure out how to write the Gringo? I'm thinking in particular of Susan Choi's American Woman, um, Dana Spiata's Eat the Document, um, to some smaller extent Rachel Kushner's um, Flamethrowers. Um, you know, these are writers who not only kind of showed me that that you know there is maybe a, a, a road in um, to discussing political issues in complicated ways. Um, but, but in the case of Choi and Spiata especially, um, helped me to figure out how to take, you know, a real historical story and turn it into mm -hmm. something that would function as a novel. Sure, that makes total sense. I think, I mean, that's really interesting and helpful to me to understand. And I, that sort of connects to my next question, which is sort of connecting this book a little bit to your previous two novels, Deus Ex Machina and um, Lady Lazarus. You know, I mean, I think, you know, that it's interesting. I mean, that I, in my own little way, you know, I, I sort of 
I wrote a few novels. I found the novelistic gesture not hugely galvanizing for my imagination. So I pivoted into nonfiction, sort of poetic essay or whatever. And that you, though, are hugely drawn toward work that hugely, you know, pulls off of real life historical precedents, whether it's you know, in this book with a clear model for, for Leo or in Lady Lazarus, there's a clear sort of Romana Clef allegory to it, even to a certain degree in Deus Ex Machina. And I just, I just would, you know, ask you to talk about that, that your imagination seems to feed not just on reality as every novelist would, but specifically on almost documented reality and then instead of meditating on it the way I might in some kind of essayistic way that your impulse is to take let's say Laurie Berenson and like and then fictionalize it I guess I would ask you to talk about that process and how real life galvanizes you and how you're drawn toward that sure and then how it enters a fictional space that whole dynamic yeah um and and as you were speaking i was i was remembering i don't know if you'll remember this david but you know several years ago when i when i first asked if you would take a look at the book i mean i you and i had known each other for some time at that point and i said look david i know that fiction's not so much your thing anymore um but i think that you might like this book because it's a book that tries to kind of i don't remember what my words were but but basically something like to, to break out of its out of its box as fiction, and 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 I feel like um, uh, more and more, at least in novels, maybe less so in short stories, but but more and more the novels I write want to do that. Um, and and I think there's there's something in me that has I don't know maybe it's some kind of arrested adolescent you know who always wants to give the middle finger to authority, but I there there's there's always something in me that resists reading conventional novels. Um, with with their sort of impregnable um, authoritative point of view and their claims to sort of creating a fully fledged alternate world that a reader has absolutely no choice but to believe in, um, you know, there, I, I, there are exceptions, of course, but a lot of the time when I when I when I read those novels, I feel like I'm suffocating and I feel deeply deeply mistrustful of the voice telling me the story. Um, I think it's also it's true that, I, I think it's also true that in, you know, in the last generation or so, um, the question of, of who, who is telling us the stories that we guide our life, lives by has, has become really the central question of our time. And so, you know, for whatever reason, when I sit down to write a book like this, um, I, I'm just all too aware of, of not wanting to sort of put on some kind of airs of authority or tell a reader what the world is, is really like. Um, you know, I'm much more interested in, in novels that sort of show their, their seams and their gaps and their, mm -hmm. and their um, inadequacies, really. Um, I'm not at all in, interested in writing nonfiction. I mean, I don't, I don't have the skill for it at all. So I end up being in this sort of in-between place of someone who, you know, if I, if I have any real artistic ability, it's to write fiction. And yet I, I, I'm extremely suspicious of fiction. Mm -hmm. And so it ends up churning out these, these novels that, um, yeah, like you said, there's this documentary impulse. Um, and there's also this impulse. I mean, you heard a little bit of it in the, in the prologue to say, you know, who am I to tell this story? I mean, I might be the worst qualified person in the world to tell this story, and yet I'm called to tell this story or what, in one way or another. And so for me, like that tension was one of the most enjoyable parts of writing The Gringa. I mean, mm -hmm. at times it was maybe the only enjoyable part of writing The Gringa. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that, I mean, I knew it would appeal to you, David. Um, yeah. I, I hope it appeals to others as strongly. No, I think it. I think that again, that sort of leads rather nicely to my next question because I, I just love the the tension in the book between the ironic intelligence of the narrating author and the the lyrical passion of the main character. And I guess for me, I don't know if this is somewhere that 
you want to go to, but I'm really interested in, you know, if you could talk a little bit about the split in you, mm -hmm. if, if this is a fair thing to say, between saying sort of Jewish irony and Jewish tikkun alum, you know, like, you know, there's a whole Jewish tradition going back millennia to heal the world, mm -hmm. the Jewish moral passion, righteous passion, um, political engagement. And then there's also just as deep a tradition of Jewish skepticism, Jewish irony, Jewish exeg exegetical skepticism. Mm -hmm. And I feel like those two in the book fight this beautiful losing battle. Like they, the two are, they fight to this beautiful battle in the two main characters. And I, yeah. you know, I would, I just asked you to talk about that a little, because to, to me, the book stages, I don't know you that well, you know, we have a, a, a burgeoning friendship, but to me, it, I imagine it's staging two very deep parts of you, a deeply engaged political self that believes in moral passion and a completely ironic, cynical self <laughs> that wants to undermine that at all times. And I just, I just love the way that you dramatize those two parts of yourself. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, I think that to, to the degree, I mean, I mean, what you're saying resonates with me and I, but I think it, it came to resonate with me fairly late in the process. Um, I've, I've never, I've never thought of myself as a particularly Jewish writer. I mean, it's not, I've never thought of myself as not Jewish, but, um, right. you know, the, the work I've done before has not engaged directly with any of these questions. Um, and, and just for, for people who haven't read it, Leonora Gelb, like, like the, the real life figure who inspired her was raised in a kind of, you know, secular middle-class Jewish family in the New York area. Um, and, and the, the narrator, uh, who I don't think you hear his name in the prologue, but he goes by the name Andres, um, is also Jewish. Um, and yeah, there is, there is this tension between, um, that, that, that kind of, you know, almost stereotypical passion for social justice that I think, um, you know, Jews very, very frequently um, exhibit. Um, and, and that need to kind of really think things through and to, um, to scrape out the bullshit and the, and the cant and the cliche from under anything as tired as a proclamation of, of a passion for social justice, right? So it can be a set of handcuffs, it can be paralyzing. And I think that, you know, to the extent that there were different sides of me playing out in these two characters of Leo and Andres, it was exactly to kind of see um, what could result from that tug of war because, because, you know, Leonora is someone who has, you know, really gone all in. She's risked everything in the name of her beliefs and she loses everything except her life in the name of her beliefs. And Andres is someone who, you know, in some, in some casual way, um, would, would claim to share the same beliefs, but who's never really done anything to, you know, in, to, to, um, uh, to pursue them, has never really done anything for anybody except himself. Um, and I think part of the, the draw to this material for me and part of the fascination for me with the, the historical uh, figure of Laurie Berenson was exactly that feeling of, you know, I'll bet that on paper, I agree with 90% of, you know, of this person's politics. So how do I end up, you know, with, 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 a, with a tenured teaching job or fellowships at Stanford University, and this person ends up in a military prison in a developing country, 14,000 feet above sea level with a life sentence for treason and terrorism. Like, you know, what does it mean to have political beliefs if you're never willing to do anything to stand up for them? And, you know, I mean, I, I've gone to my share of protests and marches, you know, when the, when the, when the Iraq war broke out in 2003, I, I don't know how many times I was marching down Market Street in San Francisco. And as we all know, it didn't make a shit's bit of difference. I mean, nobody, nobody cared how many hundreds of thousands of people around the world were marching against the US invasion of Iraq. It didn't matter. And so what I wanted to explore was a character who said, okay, 
Well, if that didn't work, then what will? Because I can't live with myself. It's a moral imperative to stop atrocity. It's a moral imperative for those who can to do anything possible to stop these forces of oppression and butchery and, and oligarchy and um, you know, international criminal conduct. And you know, I mean, everything that our country has um, partaken of in the last 19 years, everything that um, the Peruvian government partook of during their dirty war in the 80s and the early 90s. And so what does it mean for us, for people like us to say, you know, I object, right? I, I protest this, and, but to stop at the safe line. Um, I always have, and I, I probably always will, but I wanted to kind of explore, you know, what might make someone who on paper looks a little bit like me, um, turn into someone who, who doesn't stop at the line and, and, and what, the, what the outcome of that is. And, you know, as you point out, like the, the, those, those questions of, of Jewish teaching and Jewish traditions um, kind of weave their way in and out of the novel. There's a, there's a rabbi in Lima who becomes, you know, an interesting recurrent character off of whom both characters bounce some of these questions. And so um, when I finished writing the novel, I said, wow, I, I think I just, I think I just wrote a Jewish novel. <laughs> I, I hadn't had any idea I was going right. to do that. That's Nobody's that's, asked me that before, though. So I'm, yeah, I'm, that's, well, a, that's glad to hear. I'm glad I asked something semi-original. The um, <laughs> don't know if we want to bring in other people yet, or if we should keep chatting for a little bit. Do well, we let's have keep any chatting chat? for a little while? But I do want to say to to people who are listening that um, uh, I, we will take questions from the audience in a little bit, um, and probably the easiest way to do that, and by easiest I mean uh, you know, the likeliest that a tech idiot like me will be able to deal with it is just typing it into the, into the chat at the bottom of your screen. But we also may um, experiment with unmuting people and letting them ask it on camera if, if, sure. if the world doesn't implode. Sure. Um, but, but, but no, let's, let's, let's keep chatting for a while. Okay. I, always look then, I mean, one thing I, I reread the book over the last week or two, you know, in preparation for our conversation and, among the many things I admired about the book, I mean, there's so much I love about it, but um, one thing is I was struck by how much you write in sectional units, that each, each sec, I remember somebody asked me, you know, how do you write? Do you write by the sentence, by the paragraph, by the chapter? And I didn't, I wasn't sure what to answer. I, I, I think I just sort of dodged the question, but, in your case, just rereading the book over the last few weeks, I was really struck by how each section, that they aren't chapters, like, you know, each, let's say, four to six or eight or 10 page section is its own quite contained uh, kind of tropism. It kind of a little, the needle moves forward a little in that section. You're a really good, you know, because it's a, it seems an impossibly difficult, massively ambitious novel. But I was very aware on this reading, like, okay, Andrew just said, I'll write that section, and then I'll write the next section, and then I'll write the next section. It's kind of a ridiculous and maybe too writerly question, but I was very aware of you being, as it were, a sectional writer. You write by these sort of mini subchapters, and I, I just wanted to ask you to talk about that a little bit. I, you know, I think that's because at heart I'm a short story writer, um, which is sort of a ridiculous thing to say, given that for the last 15 years I've basically written three novels back to back. I, you know, I think there are two or three stories in there. But, you know, once upon a time, I thought of myself as a short story writer. Um, and I really, I, I really never want to write novels. I wake up one day and I find that I'm writing a novel, but I'm, but I'm much more comfortable in that, in that highly contained and highly structured and, and, and maybe slightly claustrophobic in the confines of, of a short story. And I think, you know, I mean, they're obviously short stories are written in, in a zillion different ways, but, um, but, you know, short stories are, are generally given in, 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 in smaller sections or scenes. Um, and so I, you know, if, if that's true of my novels, then, 
um, then I, I imagine it's just kind of a carryover from, you know, it, it's, it's just sort of like the, my, my, my training or my muscle memory as someone who is always just wanting to get back to writing short uh -huh. stories. Interesting. Yeah. Um, um, I, was, I don't know if you know the writer, Peter Malford. He's a friend of mine. He's a former student. He's written uh, two published novels and he has some other books coming out, but he's, he's writes about politics a lot. And I remember asking him once, how do you do it? I don't see a way to write overtly about politics. And he said the most obvious thing. I mean, the moment he said it, it was obvious. He goes, you can't think about these people as political figures. They're just people, just like anyone else, whose passions, you know, happen to be political. And that you can't think about them being political with a capital P. I mean, it's super obvious, but the moment that he said it, it liberated something in me. And I haven't ever written a novel about politics per se, but I have written, you know, like this book on Trump to which you, you contributed many crucial <laughs> both quoted and unquoted lines. I mean, the best line in the book by far is yours in which you say, Democrats are playing badminton and the Republicans are playing ice hockey or something like that. So it's, it's a, a fantastic yeah. line and I always quote it. I forget if it's, I think it's your line. But um, I anyway, I was wondering if you, because, you know, other, other, other books of yours, you know, have dealt with politics and you're a deeply political person and certain ways but i was wondering if you could talk about how you think about right i mean i don't know if i i i know i couldn't have written this book but i really i would have trouble writing as demonstrably as manifestly a political book as this and yet the book is highly questioning of all political gestures i was wondering if you could think about how you move from say deus to to lady to here Right. And how you thought about these sometimes daunting questions. How do I avoid writing a book of politics that isn't just, you know, as my blurb said, kind of soapbox 101, <laughs> which the book clearly avoids. Right. And if you either respond to Peter's idea or your idea, or it's like, hey, they're just people like everyone else, or no, or anything well, certainly, like that. Certainly. I mean, I think, I, well, I, first of all, uh, you know that that's that's one of that's one of the obvious arguments for writing multiple drafts because there are a, a, a lot of ways to write political fiction badly and I think I probably tried to sample all of them before you know I had a final draft and so it's one of the reasons that it took me eight years to write this book um, you know I, I think I think Peter's right in just a in just an axiomatic sense right that anytime you sit down to write fiction um, if it's not based in like the realities of three-dimensional characters, then then you're nowhere, and you know um, wh whether it's political or or not, you're just writing garbage. Um, for for this book, it was also that um, I mean a couple of things. For, first of all, like the the politics, the, the really heavy politics in this book are I don't want to say in the background because because they're all encompassing, um, but they're contextual, right? So so in Peru, there's there's the recently ended um, war against the Shining Path, which went from 1980 to 1992 and killed 70,000 Peruvians. And three years later, Leon well, in the book, six years later, Leonora Gelb shows up and is accused of wanting to start another revolution um, in, a, in a country that is, you know, is absolutely finished with revolution, just sick and tired of it and doesn't want to hear it, especially out of the mouth of a privileged white girl from the United States. Um, and as far as Andres goes, I mean, he, ha he has moved down to, to Peru um, in the early 2000s after the Iraq invasion, after the revelation of the prisoner um, abuses at the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. Um, and he wants to become uh, an apolitical person. He wants to spend the rest of his life just having a good time not thinking about any of this shit anymore. He's just disgusted by post 9-11 um, America, by the George W. Bush administration and the horrific lies it told and the, and the, and the war crimes that it committed. Um, and he wants to be away from it. So, so with both of those characters, it, you know, I, I was able to kind of put them in opposition to what the politics was. And that I think removed some of the temptation to make either one of them soapboxy kind of people. Um, mm -hmm. But the other thing, especially in, in, in Leonora's case, is, 
is that her politics fails, right? I mean, and, and you know from the very beginning of the book, the scene that I read, that her politics are going to fail. They're gonna fail her, they're gonna fail the Peruvian people, they're gonna fail her comrades. Um, and so something about that kind of took the air out of the balloon as well, where I could say, well, you know, I may not know what it's like to be, you know, a leftist guerrilla, um, but I know what it's like to be a failure. And I know what it's like to, um, to find out that the things that you really believed in are gonna, are gonna crumble all around you. Um, and so, you know, that made both of these characters really human to me um, and I think helped me avoid some of those pitfalls. Nice. I mean, it's also about registers of language that her, even as well-intentioned as she is, her language tends to be relatively hackneyed. Yeah. And that his, Andres's language, although he has a lot of, you know, he's rather lazy or whatever, his language is alive. He writes, you know, he writes really well. That opening passage you read, you know, there's a lot his language is better than hers. And so there's a fascinating tension. Yeah, well, she's, she's kind of one dimensional, right? Yeah. And, um, and, and deliberately so. Um, I, I mean, I, as, as fascinated as I am with the figure who inspired her, Lori Berenson, um, I, I wanted to write a novel that was about a character who got kind of far away from Lori Berenson because I, I find her to be not one dimensional, but, but, but just not that interesting, right? I mean, in none of the interviews that I've read of hers and certainly not in the footage that, you know, that scene was, was, was kind of a, of a, of a reenactment of, um, you know, I, there, there's, there's, there's no place, I found no place to kind of slip past um, what she's fronting to the world and, and find, you know, a more complicated person, um, a person with, insecurities or, 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 or pain. Um, I mean, certainly she's suffered quite a lot of pain 15 years in a military prison, but, uh, but I mean in, in a more idiosyncratic or a more deeply intimate mm -hmm. way. And so, um, you know, I think, I think I built some of that into Leonora, even while trying to kind of build a, a, a structure of, of, of backstory and um, self-doubt around her that would make her a character I was you know, more willing to spend five, six, seven, eight years with. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, well, it's, I really admire the book, as you, as you well know. And um, I wonder if there's anyone wants to, I could, you know, talk with you about the book endlessly, but I, I, I don't know how much time we have, maybe 10 minutes. Yeah. And Does anyone some... want to jump in or want, I can, um, anyone have a thought from some of your former colleagues or friends? And there's, um, I, I, I believe there's a function um, that most people can see where there's a button that says raise hand. And if anyone raises their hand, I can unmute you and you can even ask the question, you know, live on Zoom, or you just put it in the chat, which is probably simpler for everybody. Does anyone have a thought mm -hmm. of any kind? Please. Or do people just want to hear Andrew and me can keep on chatting? Just blather. And um, Anyone have a question? If not, I'm happy to keep on. Well, let's keep it going and see if anything turns up. You yeah. can type into the chat at any point. Um, what are some of my other questions for you, Andrew? Well, some of my other questions are less off center, you know, such as, you know, there is that great passage toward the end where, you know, the main character has this epiphanic moment where he just he feels like a fraud after publishing his book and he determines to be a more engage writer i i just have this sort of boring you know autobiographical question whether you had anything like that is how i mean i'm an admirer of your previous two books especially lady lazarus and you know i don't think those need to be by any means kicked to the curb but i wonder if you had any sort of similar self-questioning like you know i really do want and need to write a much more politically engaged work you know with you know some kind of 
feeling that, that my work so far had had reached a sort of end point of some kind. It, well, I think that um, that both of those, both of the earlier books have, a, you know, they're they're both full of culture critique, which sure. is obviously political, but um, but they're both satirical in their way, and and as as valuable a, a political tool as satire is and has always been, there's something about, I mean, I, it may be even just a contextual thing, the way that the way that satire is read um, in contemporary American culture that um, I, I started to worry um, was a little bit toothless. Um, but no, I, I, it, there, it wasn't so much that I had a moment of saying, I need to change the direction of my work as just, um, you know, having, having lived through the early 2000s, having lived through the George W. Bush administration and the Patriot Act and the and the you know the criminal atrocious invasion of Iraq and the wars that have have never stopped since then, um, I just felt myself becoming um, less and less capable of looking away. Um, there there there's a scene fairly early in the book where Andres is remembering um, his when his first novel came out. It was right in the middle of the Iraq invasion and his first novel was, it was about like, I don't know, like, like postgraduate trust fund kids who start a commune in Oregon. And then they have all these kind of internecine battles and sleeping with each other and breaking up. And, um, you know, and he's, and he, he, he vividly remembers being in a bookshop in Berkeley of all places, um, a few days after the Iraq invasion began and somebody saying something to him along the lines of, um, you know why should why should readers be interested in a book like this now, given everything that's happened in the world? And you know that that's really a turning point for him. He looks back on that with a lot of shame, and he gave some kind of canned answer about um, you know empathy and 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 art and blah blah blah. And he says something like, you know, I, I sat there with a with a cheese plate and a, and a glass of wine and, and, and lectured these people about empathy and, and I realized what an absolute fraud I was. I didn't have that moment per se, but, but by the time you know, we got rid of George W. Bush and his people in 2008, um, there, I had just spent so much time thinking about and writing about and you know, in places like the Huffington Post and, um, and, and, and other venues about you know, what our country had become and there was just no way that it was not going to end up in a novel of some kind. Um, and so the irony of this book is I started it by writing about what I thought was the worst presidential administration in American history. But by the time I finished writing it and published it, you know, I think we all um, could agree there's someone who's given George W. Bush a run for his money. That said, I mean, I, you know, it's it's clear that Donald Trump is the best thing that ever happened to George W. Bush because of all the ways that, you know, even someone like me can look back now and say like, ah, you know, I kind of miss the guy. Um, right, I mean, it's crucial in my view not to create a revisionist history in which somehow George Bush, the same thing happened to George Bush's father where somehow George Bush 41 is somehow perceived to be some sort of patrician benevolent right. overlord. I mean, he was awful yeah. too i mean it's this this is weird back formation that we all do whereby you know you know each increasingly horrific president ends up emptying out the awfulness of the previous president but right there's anyway, always something likely. worse right around the corner yeah but there, um, there are um there are a few questions in the chat right now oh, good um and and as much as i love my wife i'm going to skip hers um no. Here and uh, and Jenny Anglin asks um, what what it took to create the sociological and personal world in which the novel takes place. Um, and I will say it took a, a lot of time. Um, I lived in Peru for two years in the late '90s, um, but I lived in Cusco, and most of the novel takes place in Lima. And I was not politically engaged or even particularly um, proactive in learning a lot about the history. Um, uh, and the politics of the country at the time. And that's something I look back on with a lot of regret. Um, and so when I started writing this book, I knew I had to spend a lot more time in Peru and I had to spend it better. Um, so I, I made five or six trips 
over the course of the years that I was writing the book, um, most of which I spent in Lima, but I, I went back to Cusco a couple of times. I went into the um, sort of less developed areas a little bit. And I just talked to as many people as I could, people from all walks of life who had different perspectives on the war years and what they had meant. I talked to journalists, I talked to former activists, I talked to lawyers, I talked to veterans, I talked to people who had lost family members who had either, you know, been killed in the war or who had just, you know, disappeared and had been gone now for 20, 25 years and, you know, of course are dead, but they'll never even have the, the closure of, of, of finding a body. Um, because I just wanted to see this war and its aftermath from it, from every possible angle to make sure, you know, certainly as a, as, as an American writer, um, I don't feel at all qualified to write the book about Peru and its war and its culture. And I really needed to make sure that there were as many Peruvian voices um, in the book, either explicitly or informing the ways that I wrote the book. Um, and so, um, you know, I have so many people in Peru to thank for really educating me, you know, for taking someone who just, you know, had barely skimmed the surface of what all these issues meant um, and how they had led up to the incidents that I was describing um, and, and walked me through it and argued with me and argued with the last person I had talked to and disagreed about everything and really showed me how multifaceted um, the story had to be um, and also how unstable the story had to be because um, it's the nature of war, right? It, I mean, no two people agree on exactly what happened, even at the very basic level of facts, statistics, body counts. Um, everyone in Peru remembers it differently and, and will get bang on the table, red in the face about how wrong their neighbor is about what happened. And so I had to build some of that instability into it as well um, to get back to one of my earlier answers, because I, I think it's, um, a, you know, that idea of an authoritative narrator especially about material like this is always deeply deeply suspect and when you're talking about um a story that involves seventy thousand dead bodies it's it's more than suspect it's immoral and so building that kind of um instability or self-questioning into the story um was necessary um and and helped me to draw on a lot of these stories that i heard over the years from from the people i talked to um Let's see, we're getting up on, uh, on an hour here. Maybe we'll just take one or two other questions. Um, a question about revision. I've said I love revisions as much or more than writing the book. And can I explain that a bit? I will say, and you know, the other writers in the, in the room um, might relate to this. I, I, I think if there's, if there's any way that I can clearly sort of pat myself on the back and say that I've grown or gotten better as a writer over the course of three books and you know a couple of decades of doing this it's that i have come to see that revision is where the action's at i mean revision is is really the place where all of the the, the most important work happens um you know i think i think i was as guilty as 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 many writers especially i think especially male writers when I was younger of, you know, just being so completely in love with every word that I wrote and, um, you know, I had a hard time hearing a lot of, of criticism, at least until it had really been hammered into me uh, a number of times. Um, and I think that um, I, I, I definitely feel that I've matured in that way where I know that, you know, all that stuff about first thought, best thought, and, um, it, you know, there are good thoughts and, and, and you do have to go through a process of, of kind of getting everything out onto the page, um, which can be excruciating and can take forever. But for me, when I then sit down and I have something that I can call a draft, which is, you know, tens of thousands of words, hundreds of pages, and can really look at it as like the raw material of the book that I'm trying to write, that's, that, that's just this really joyous moment. I mean, it's like, it's, you know, it's like jumping into a sandbox that's just full of lots of stuff to play with. Um, and some of the stuff is, is, is crap that you're going to throw out that doesn't really work anymore. But some of it's like really interesting toys that you can then play with and combine and, and, and put into new forms. And so to, to me, 
Um, and I tell this to my students all the time, you know, the, the, the mark of someone who um, is not only talented, but might actually sort of find some success as a writer is not that they can write these beautiful sentences or these wonderful scenes the first time around. It's that they can sit down with all the stuff they wrote the first time around and then come to it with some kind of objectivity and patiently shape it into something that's better than it was when it started. Thanks for that. Don't know uh, if you want to answer a couple of more or that we get kicked well, off of. Let's ask, let's ask Grace, what do you think? Should we start to wrap it up? Should I take one more? You can unmute, Gray, or I'll unmute. Can I unmute me. Okay. <laughs> I think that your fans have spoken, and we should probably do one more question. Okay, let me let me see if I can find a good one here. Um, so, given that it took eight years to write the novel, did the current administration influence this book at all? Um, yes. Uh, I mean, like I said before. Is, is very interesting to sit down in 2011 to write a book that, you know, among other things, I wanted to beat the hell out of the Bush administration because I felt we had, that we had just lived through, um, you know, one of the most shameful periods in our country's history. Um, and, and also to think, you know, maybe with some reason that there would be some appetite um, uh, for, for books that looked back skeptically and critically on that period that in some ways had traumatized all of us. I think it had certainly outraged many, many of us. Um, but to find that by the time I had finished the book, the world had really moved on and there was a whole fresh set of outrages to, to bang our fists on the table about. Um, but at the same time, you know, the, some of the criticisms of American politics that come up in this novel, you know, are, 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 are pretty evergreen. Um, you know, the, the, the arrogance and the penchant that the United States has for projecting its power, both military, militarily and economically around the world, feeling entitled to tell other countries what to do with, um, you know, with their militaries, with their, um, their political systems, with their economies, you know, right now with their, with their medical infrastructure, um, you know, these are things that have not really gone out of style and, you know, you can go back, certainly as far as the Spanish-American War, if not farther, and look at the ways that America has just imposed itself on the rest of the world. Um, in my lifetime, or at least in my recent memory, um, what George W. Bush did in Iraq was the most egregious example of it. Um, but, you know, everything about the Trump administration and how it has treated other countries um, and even how it has treated constituencies in the United States that it doesn't agree with um, is, is absolutely in keeping um, with, with these American traditions. And so, you know, I say somewhat tongue in cheek that, George, that Trump is the best thing that ever happened to George W. Bush. And I think it is possible to look back on George W. Bush and, and see someone who had some kind of, um, you know, human heart or human frailties or capacity for empathy, even if he made some of the most atrocious decisions in American political history. Um, some things that, you know, really do make, make us a little bit nostalgic for him. But at the same time, you know, at, at, at least in terms of how they affect the rest of the world, there's not really any daylight between Trump and George W. Bush. And there's frankly not a huge amount of daylight between them and and Barack Obama and, and Bill Clinton, to be, to be perfectly honest. I mean, this country has always imposed its will on other countries and been willing to slaughter thousands of people in order to make that happen. And that has barely changed um, in my lifetime. Um, hopefully it will, but I'm not all that hopeful about it. So, you know, the, 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 meet, the, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, right? I wrote this book thinking that it was commenting mostly on the prior Republican administration. In fact, it turns out to comment, uh, you know, just as pointedly, I think, on the current administration. Um, and because these things never really stop being a part of who this country is and, and, and what we do. So... I think 
Thank we'll you, Andrew. <laughs> thanks to everyone for, yes. for listening and for the questions. And thanks to the University Bookstore and thanks to David. And I think Grace has a little parting message. Just a few. Um, thank you all for joining us today to celebrate Andrew and his wonderful new book. You can purchase copies of the Gringa from University Bookstore um, in the bio link below our event here today. And um, as a bonus, Andrew has sent over some very special, unique, limited edition book plates that he signed just for us. And so these book plates are all unique. Um, he's written a different personalized message in on each. So we will include one of those um, with your order. And so now um, I just want to thank both Andrew and David for an absolutely wonderful discussion. It was a riveting and very eye-opening conversation. And we thank you for your time today. Thanks to you, Grace. Thanks to you, thank David. You. And thanks, thanks everyone. for coming. <laughs> thank you. Everybody. Support your independent bookstores. Thank and everybody stay healthy. <laughs> See you Good soon. Night. Bye. Bye.